Hello and welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast covering everything Deep Sea. I'm Dr. Thomas Lindley. I'm here as ever with Dr. Alan Jameson. You doing all right, mate? Yes, I'm fine, Tom. Good, good. And as ever, dear listener, it's good to deep see you again. Did you abyss us? Oh, Jesus. I'm going to start stacking them. I'm going to start stacking them for as long as they make sense. No, no, I don't think you should. (laughs) Please stop. Please stop. This bit isn't working. It's getting worse. In this episode, we're going to continue to explore uh, communication of science and where maybe the very dry, impersonal scientific style sometimes lets us down. So with Alex, we talked about art and sort of the emotional response. And Don also mentioned in his interview the importance of storytelling and that actually it's a, it's a skill for public engagement and it's a skill that a lot of scientists do possess. Uh, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's uh, difficult to wield, I suppose is the right term. But before we get going with our interview, uh, has anything caught your eye this month, Alan, news-wise? What's going on out there? There's been a few things. What do you know about biologically inspired geometry, Tom? Biologically inspired geometry? There's, um, there's some good sort of engineering style stuff uh, inspired yeah. by biology. What have you spotted? Sponges. Glass sponges. So people at Harvard University have found a sponge that has this intricate skeletal structure, which is like super strong and outperforming comparable structures that humans have been using for bridges and such for a long time. It's this weird tube-like skeleton they have that forms a like a square grid, diagonal reinforced. And uh, they did a whole bunch of structural testing on it and found out it's actually really, really good. Hmm. So they're going to use it for things like building great strength-to-weight ratio structures for likes of bridges and that. And it's all inspired by a deep-sea sponge. That's very cool. And of course, it's going to try and minimize any wasted resources so that sponge has got a brilliant like resource to strength ratio yeah it's got millions of years of evolution to refine it right on every episode if we pick up a biologically inspired thing we can build something at the end of the year we've already got super black now we've got some really lightweight structure so we've, we've got a black structure now to work with right a super strong completely dark structure okay interesting yeah i'll find something for next week speaking of sponges though tom have you ever sniffed a deep sea sponge i have what is that smell it's gross isn't it it's one of the worst smells I think I've ever smelled in my life. Is it because the material is so old that they're, they're filtering out some very old? I have no idea. It was one of those. It's one of those smells that once you smell it, it gets. It seems to like get into your head, and you can smell it for the rest of the day. It's really. But I guess it's not supposed to be detectable by an air-breathing mammal, right? So we were never meant to sniff it. So who are we to complain? It probably works really effectively underwater. <laughs> I, I think it's the age of the material, but it doesn't even. It doesn't even smell entirely of decomposition. It's quite a. Ammonia smell, it's quite chemical almost. Yeah, it doesn't feel very natural, does it? I remember we pulled up loads on Scotia and the guy started cutting them open. It was like, oh my lord, what is that? That's amazing. Really impressive. Anyway, in terms of technology, there's another article out recently. Have you heard about the robot squid? No, other than my bad B movies. Oh, this is not a movie, this is a real one. Finally. This is people at the University of California in San Diego. Yeah, they made a squid like robot. It can swim on its own and take pictures. It's really fast, apparently. It does. It's got the whole jet propulsion thing that squid do. So it, it's a bellows-like mantle. Yeah, it's soft. They've made it soft enough that it won't damage fish or coral either. That's very cool. It's a little soft body thing. No, it's very cool. So like an AUV, it's going to just be sent off to do its own thing. I guess so, yeah. But it reckons it can get up to speed of about 32 centimetres a second. I'm guessing it's a uh, quite a start-stop motion, like the way squids do swim, like a pulsing movement. Yeah, presumably, yeah. Interesting, the way it's got a little factoid in there. About how fast real squid can swim. Oh, go on. How fast can a real squid swim, Tom, in miles per hour? They certainly look nippy. They are nippy. <laughs> we nippy squid. The squiddy as well. <laughs> the nippy bit's in the middle, I found it. I'm going to go 20 miles an hour. Close, 23 to 25 miles an hour. Oh, I'm usually really wrong on these guesses. Oh, I'm quite pleased with that. Yeah. Do you know about the, uh, the strange coordination that requires with their different axon diameters. I've been told this. I can't remember off the top of my head. Go for it. It's a weird one. So they've got some of the longest nerve axons uh, in the animal kingdom, and they're actually used to study. You can extract an entire nerve axon from a squid, and you can sort of experiment with it in grim ways. But you can alter the speed at which the signal travels down that axon by messing with its diameter. So squeezing that mantle and the way that squids jet away that has to be perfectly coordinated over the entire mantle or essentially rupture certain parts. Like if, if they tense at different points, the pressure inside is so great, it would actually sort of do damage to the animal. 
So all these axons are perfectly coordinated in their width, so that even though the, the signal originates from the brain, it reaches every part of the mantle at the same moment, so that it can all contract as one holistic movement, really. All right, I'll believe you. <laughs> <laughs> you see it with enough confidence, Tom. I'll, I'll believe that, yeah. So anyway, sticking with squid, there's another news article involving deep sea squid. 860 metres deep, those folks on the Schmidt vessel Falcor recently filmed for the first time ever the elusive ram's horn squid. Apparently it's super fast as well. Oh, cool. It's a cool little thing, yeah. It's cool because they put a tweet about it and there was a couple of news articles about it. And in the news article, it mentions uh, Mike Vecchioni, the lord of the squid. And it's, it's to sort of benchmark how much Mike is the lord of the squid in that it actually states that he's never seen it before. So that's how rare this is. If he's never seen it before, it's never been seen before. Which I thought was quite cool. And the other, the other story, that's, which is not news at all, it's only news to me, is a paper also involving squid. And that's just a coincidence. I haven't actually just been Googling squid. It's been a really squiddy month. It was a paper I came across for something else, which I thought was just a beautiful bit of science that really lends itself to a lovely little story. And it was actually published, I think, a couple of years ago by a Portuguese-led group. And it's about how squid can hijack jellyfish. Right. Are you with me? Yeah, okay. Right. So they witnessed this a unique interaction between a male octopod and a jellyfish. Right? So the squid grabbed the jellyfish on an oral-to-oral surface orientation, i.e. the underside of the jelly is right on the, the mouth, if you like, of the squid. And then it starts to swim around with it. Right. And they reckon that that, that whole behavior doesn't fit anything to do with camouflage or shelter or transportation or possibly weapon stealing. What it's doing is it's using it as a defense because the jellyfish tentacles are still loose and free-flowing on the outside of it. So it's basically using the jellyfish and its tentacles as a shield. How cool is that? Nice, I like that. So they had divers in the water. So this is, I mean, it says it's a deep sea squid, but it's obviously quite a shallow observation, but there were divers in the water and they, they were sort of messing with it a little bit and it sounds like it was <laughs> it was actually sort of coming at them with this jellyfish going <laughs> on. <laughs> no, you don't. Right, I've had it. We should, I thought it would be great if we could add that to our biologically inspired solutions for everyday life in that if you are, for example, riot police, you could replace the shield with a mass of stinging jellyfish. Or just hurl jellyfish into a crowd to try and disperse them, because it'd be really irritating if there were tentacles everywhere. That's true. That's true. And people hate jellyfish anyway. Yeah. Oh, that'd do it. But live jellyfish is weapons. It's interesting. That's what these squid do. So there you go. It's a robot squid, a uh, elusive squid, a uh, hijacking jellyfish squid, and super strong sponges that stink. Very squiddy month. Going back to our uh, documentary cliches, there was one that made me really mad. And I think it was a it was a Discovery Channel one. It was talking about the it was the giant Pacific octopus. It was lots of cello-y, dum 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 dum, you know, frightening music. Of course. And it was apparently pursuing the diver in a menacing way. This enormous octopus. And I'm watching it, and I'm and I'm looking at the the inhalant and exhalant siphon as it's bellowing and sort of breathing. But I was just like, something doesn't seem right. That octopus isn't moving right. And they'd reversed the video. <laughs> nice try. Yeah. And what they said was an attack from this terrifying animal was actually the camera person pursuing and hounding it as it was trying to get away. And they just played that in reverse and said it was an attack. Oh, that's not cool, is it? That's not cool. That octopus needs to lawyer up because that is unfair representation. That is unfair storytelling in a prelude to what's coming later. Absolutely. I've got a new segment to punt, Alan, if we can try it out, see Good if it fits. punt. Go ahead yeah, and punt, punt, Tom. Okay, right. So I really enjoy the names of a lot of deep sea creatures. I think they've got some really interesting etymology, partly because some of them are hundreds of years old, and they transcend multiple languages, and we sort of Latinize as well. And so you end up with quite a, a treasure hunt sometimes to find out just what the names mean. Uh, and sometimes they're quite funny and informative. So I wanted to include a segment which I'm going to dub an ass fish by any other name would smell as sweet, which sounds childish, but actually it's a Shakespeare quote, and that makes it fancy. Well done. Shakespeare. You got Shakespeare into this. I know. It, it makes it fancy, you know, like, a, like an episode of Fraser, that kind of fancy. Ooh, clever. <laughs> yeah, I know, highbrow. It's an educational podcast, supposedly. I mean, that's what I filled out. So this is basically a, a testament to one of the awkward animal names that we have. Me and Alan see a lot of cuskeels of the Bassazetus genus. And of course, when we're talking to the public, we don't want to use the Latin name exclusively. We want to make it a little bit more accessible. 
But the unfortunate thing is with that uh, genus of fishes is their common name is assfish, which actually originates as, as donkey. But uh, you always get a snigger when you uh, talk about an assfish. And unfortunately, there is a robust assfish, which is just even funnier. So as a testament to unusual deep sea names, I thought I'd add a little segment. Right, so in this episode, I would like to talk about uh, the Macrurid family of fishes, the Macruridae. They're related to cod, deep sea adapted group. There's loads of different species on sort of the continental slopes uh, at bathial depth. And then on the abyssal plains, we see these really specialized scavengers as well. They're quite distinctive fish. Uh, one of the most eye-catching parts about them is their long whip-like tail. Uh, and that gives them one of their common names, which is a rat tail. And it's actually in their, in their Latin name as well. The Macrurid comes from macros meaning great and aura meaning tail. So they were even originally named sort of for their great tail, this long whip-like tail. But they have another common name, which was a, a really unusual one. As ever, the questions you get asked by kids are the most deeply cutting and the most <laughs> difficult questions I've ever asked. I'd far rather go up in front of a, a conference of my peers than a, a load of school kids because they will ask things I have never even thought about. They wanted to know why they're also known as grenadiers. Why is this group of fish named after uh, an element of the military that specializes in the use of grenades? And it really sent me on a scavenger hunt. I couldn't actually figure out why, why this was. And I was speaking to a, a few other fish taxonomists, and it was actually Andrew Stewart of Te Papa Museum in New Zealand who, uh, who finally figured it out for me. So the very first rat tail, the very first grenadier, uh, was caught near Norway, and it was described in Norwegian, and it was the round-nosed grenadier, and that was described in 1765. And I found the original paper, and it, it looks like a religious text. It's sort of handwritten on this round paper with little uh, flourishes in the corners and things like that. It, it looks like an old religious text, so it was incredible to find this, and I'll, I'll put a link uh, on there. It's freely available. I, I can't read it, unfortunately, but it looks beautiful. And so that was in 1765, and it was Johann Ernst Gunnarus, who was a... Uh, Norwegian taxonomist who named a fair few things. In the sort of mid 1700s, the grenadiers of that time would wear either a tall furred cap, uh, similar to the guards around Buckingham Palace, the big furry ones, or they would wear something uh, based off the bishop's murder. The grenadiers tended to be the most physically intimidating members of the military. And so they'd wear these tall hats partly to increase their stature and make them even more intimidating. And partly because the wide-rimmed hats of the time would actually be difficult when you're lobbing grenades because you want your arm to move freely over the top. I looked up the Murta cap, and in cross-section, it is absolutely the dorsal fin of a grenadier fish. Uh, and that's how we think it got its name. So it's this high triangular dorsal fin of the fish. And other than its whip-like tail, it's one of the most distinctive things about it. In fact, it's so distinctive that our company is named after one of the grenadiers, Armatus. And it forms the logo. You can see it in the logo to this podcast. That is the high triangular fin of the grenadier and the grenadier guardman's uh, hat, which I thought was incredible. Good sleuthing, Tom. I enjoyed that one. That was a really good student's question. It took me like a week to figure that out. And it was lovely seeing that original description. A name from the mid 1700s. Thinking about storytelling. I've been thinking about storytelling. And I think we can talk about something which is well, we've already touched upon a little bit in some previous episodes about the way in which deep sea is portrayed or disseminated to, to others and similarities with other scientific disciplines because I think we shouldn't ever draw a ring around deep sea science and sort of protect us from all these other things. I think there's a lot to be learned by looking at other disciplines. In this particular case, let's talk about the other chthonic, which means relating or to or inhabiting the underworld. Really? What, what's that word again? Chthonic. Chthonic. It was Glenn Singleman put me onto that. Actually, he kept talking about the chthonic. I'm like, okay, okay, all right. Google, Google, Google. <laughs> no, but screw it, right? So if you think about geosciences, the subterranean geosciences, they had similar issues, right? So deep sea is not the only scientific discipline that's had to deal with difficult and changing public perceptions and how the storytelling has to evolve with that. So the subterranean geosciences had to also accommodate cultural and metaphorical perspectives of, of the public, I guess. Right? So if you think about how you go back a hundred years or so, you have the whole sea monsters, you have this idea that things find neutral buoyancy in midwater, and then there's this, this whole spooky thing that no one really understands. It was the same when you go underground as, as when you go under the sea. Right? So the subterranean had this sort of similar primordial sense of darkness combined with 
opportunities for commercial enterprise, which is what people, you know, mining essentially, like tin mining in Cornwall and that kind of stuff, people started to go to go underground. So then you had this weird transition between the weird and the, we can make a lot of money out of this. Interesting push and pull there. Yeah, I, I, it was described as being an era of dystopian dread and utopian dreams. Oh, I like that. I know. That's my album title. <laughs> so it's kind of like the archetypal monsters dwelling in the deep, right? You've got these pre-industrial geological endeavours, such as mining, I suppose, and they had to appease the supernatural when this first started going on the ground. And you had goblins and dwarfs, and they were known as Tommy knockers, or knockers or knackers. And then there was the bucker, the bogles, the spriggans, and what's called the picking gad men. So there were all sorts of these strange ghosts and spirits that you had to appease at the peril of both the miners and mineral production. So if, if you wanted to, if the miners were to operate safely, you had to keep the deities happy. And if you wanted to actually make a lot of money, you also had to keep them happy. Strangely maritime. Yeah. I feel like old dangerous jobs sort of breed superstition and you need anything to make you think, oh, I'm, I'm going to come home from this. You know, I've, I've, done, I've done the ritual and now I'm going to be okay. Just because you're living such a dangerous life. Yeah. Even that line, the geosciences world, as that moved into the industrial era, that sort of sublime dread of displeasing the spiritual deities kind of evolved into a, I guess, a reverence in the face of significant resource potential, because suddenly you're just making a lot of money by pulling a lot of stuff out of the ground, right? So that fear kind of, that fear of the chthonic realm suddenly had more monetary value than it did sort of spiritual. But then you got 100 years later, and you're looking at a similar sort of way in which we've kind of ditched that idea of there are no sea monsters out there coming to get us. We don't need to appease, you know, the, the gods of the ocean or the, you know, like things from Greek mythology and so on. We're in a similar position now because you have things like deep sea mining about to occur. So you've now moved from the weird spooky deep sea to, ooh, there's a lot of money to be made here, right? So we're, we're, we're following in the footsteps of what the geosciences have already had to deal with. Right, and we'll talk about deep sea mining in another episode. It's now it's not the time to get into that because it's quite a quite a big issue. But it's at least one episode. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, but it's just, the, the point I'm making is we're kind of following in the footsteps of this. So, well, the reimagining of the subterranean environment has led to a sort of cultural disparity because people are feeling really anxious because they don't like the idea that scientists or industry are tampering with the nature between their feet. Right, you're messing with stuff that is supposed to be solid and stable. Right, so they. If you think about things like fracking and carbon capture storage, geothermal exploitation or burial of nuclear waste or whatever it is, people are quite rightly concerned, right? They're really, really into this. And this is where storytelling becomes quite a big deal because in the deep sea, you have this almost subconscious fear-led apathy towards the deep sea, whereas the subterranean, you have this very conscious fear that leads to anxiety and almost distrust, right? Because what the geosciences are is there's lots of papers written on this and there's no equivalent papers written in marine science as far as I can tell. There's a few sort of shallower ones, but certainly not deep sea ones, in that a lot of the time, the concepts that are being explained are not being explained well. It's freaking people out. The issue with storytelling there is that there's a sort of want for how to reshape those stories, how to take something that's unbelievably complicated and try and tell that story in a way that can be easily digestible and to appease any concerns that people have or, or try and make people feel better about it. I, mean, there was, I read a paper and there, was, and there was a survey about what people felt was going on in the geosciences and they, there's a general consensus that they thought carbon capture storage meant there was giant high-pressure bubbles forming underground that could explode at any minute. And of course, that's not the case. But that's how it comes across if you don't tell the story properly. So I see lots of parallels here with Deep Sea, except for the fact that geosciences are trying to take something which they know is phenomenally complicated and need to streamline that down through storytelling into something more digestible to stop people feeling anxious or, or even distrustful of the industry. And then the flip side of that, you've got Deep Sea people and the way in which the Deep Sea is being portrayed is just far too simple it's, it's, and, and people don't really care. There's elements there that you need to meet in the middle where the commonality is between these two issues is not the science. It's not what the geosciences are doing. It's not what deep sea science is doing. It's not what marine biology is doing. It's the storytelling. That's the most important part. That's what binds all that together. The skill of storytelling is not something all scientists possess. And if we do it wrong, things can really backfire. So who are we going to talk to about the art of storytelling? How do we learn how to do it properly? I don't know, Tom. You tell me. I mean, uh, an author? We could we could ask an author because they, they they tell stories, don't they? That's like their job. They do, they do them in those book things. Yeah, professional storyteller. That's what we need. Where are we going to get a professional storyteller? I happen to know one. 
You know a professional author? I do. She writes books. Remember those things? They're like 3D PDFs that you have to manually turn the pages on. Great analogue feel to them. Yeah. Kind of woody smell. Books. Do you think she'd be up for giving us a bit of training on storytelling? I think we could just call her up and ask her. She's not busy telling stories on three-dimensional PDFs. Well, she could tell her tell us a story about storytelling. That's what to do. She would give her a call. Yeah, go for it. All right, then. Today, we are privileged to have a New York Times best-selling author on our show, uh, and that is Susan Casey. And Susan has written books on a whole load of ocean-related topics from The Wave, Devil's Teeth, Voices in the Ocean, and she's currently writing a book on the deep sea, which is how we first crossed paths. That's an exclusive, isn't it? That is an exclusive. I'm not sure anyone knows that, but she's happy for us to say. And she's clearly an author with an interest in the oceans, and she's recently found herself embroiled in the world of deep sea particularly submersible. She's even been underwater and she might be going out again. So Susan joins us from upstate New York. Hello, Susan. Hello. Hi. So first of all, I want to ask that your books clearly have oceans as a central theme. Is that something you deliberately set out to do to to write books about the oceans or is that a bit of a coincidence or do you feel like one led on to the other? What's the sort of uh, story behind that? Well, you know, the thing about books is you get a story that tells you that it wants to become a book. It's a good enough story that you can write 300 and whatever pages about it. And it so happens that the first story I came across that sort of morphed into a big enough story that I thought, hmm, this is a book, was a really ocean-centric story. And once I got into that, that was the book was called The Devil's Teeth. And it was about a neighborhood of great white sharks and these very uh, idiosyncratic scientists that were studying in, in these weird, weird islands that are 27 miles due west of the Golden Gate Bridge. They're just kind of sitting out off the coast of San Francisco. And as I began to report that story, I learned more and more about the ocean. I wasn't really someone who knew a ton about the ocean. I grew up in Canada, not ocean territory. But as I hung out with these scientists and spent time on these islands and learned more about the sharks, it just sort of grew. It really snowballed. I mean, to me, it was just endlessly fascinating. And that's kind of job one when you're writing a book is to find something that you are so fascinated and so passionate about that the reader will feel that and hopefully come along for that ride. So that's how it started. It's funny because those islands are really ominous looking, aren't they? Just the, the topography of them looks quite frightening. And then you put you add the sharks into the mix as well. And it's 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 mad that that's all just sat off California. It looks like something's made up for a movie, right? Oh, absolutely. That's why they're called the Devil's Teeth. The funny thing about the title is people think it might relate to the sharks, but it's actually the islands themselves. They just sort of jut out of the water like fang. And they're, you know, they're on a different tectonic plate than the mainland. So they're geologically, they're even different. And when you go out there in a boat and you see these things kind of just shearing out of the water, you just think, how can this possibly be related to, I don't know, like Union Square in San Francisco? It's like you're on another planet, really. Is it the sort of natural environment of the, the topography of islands or the ocean itself? Or is it the marine life that captivates you? Or is this all about this complex interplay between people and how they interact with the oceans, how they interact with things like these islands and all the marine fauna as well. I mean, is, is it, are the oceans just a backdrop or are they a kind of almost a character in your stories? Oh, it's definitely a character and it's really all of the above, I think. I mean, my interest is, it has always been in water, it, period. Like, I can't remember a time when I didn't look at a body of water and just want to know what was down there. And that's really always the question I'm sort of interested in answering is, what's down there? And and what does it look like? And what does it feel like? And, and really, how does it interact with us in our lives? So Devil's Teeth really dealt with a lot of biology, marine biology, but also there were just a ton of seabirds out there. And the, the scientists I was writing about had trained as ornithologists. So of course, they started noticing these big bloody shark attacks that were happening right offshore and wanting to go see them, as scientists will do. I spent a lot of time also around something like 300,000 nesting seabirds on this 65-acre island. But then the next book I worked on, uh, which was about giant rogue waves and these band of guys that are trying to all vie to surf a 100-foot wave, was really about the physical oceanography and wave science and things like that. And then in Voices in the Ocean, my third book, I wrote about cetaceans and about the human relationship with cetaceans. So there is back to biology. And now in the book about the deep ocean, I think it's all of them. The biology of the deep ocean, which is you guys know better than anyone, is really weird and fascinating. And then there's everything else. 
I'm glad this is my fourth book and I've learned some stuff because it's a lot. It's actually a lot to write about. No, I think we're the same scientifically. I mean, we've moved from relatively straightforward deep sea biology stuff, and then suddenly you get more involved with geologists, more involved with chemists, more involved with the hydrography. And so, you know, it, it, it's a really weird, sterile way of telling stories, but just <laughs> for a different audience, if you like. We can curious about water and, 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 and wondering what's down there. I mean, you recently did a sub dive, right? You've been down off, was it the Bahamas or something in a, mm -hmm. the Triton submarine? Can you tell us about that? Oh, I went down um, uh, on with Tim McDonald, who was training to be a sub pilot, and it was just sublime. It was the most sublime experience. And I had been a scuba diver and a free diver, but of course, that's, you know, nothing. And it's hard to put it into words. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Was it what you expected? It was even more spectacular than what I expected. I wasn't scared for one second. I mean, even though there's something inherently risky about it, it's well thought out. The machines are amazing. But it sort of proved this theory that I have that you can't be scared when you're fully in the present moment. And fear is really something that comes up afterwards when you think, oh my God, what did I just do? Or that could have turned out badly. But when you're in the present moment, it, it really is just awe. And um, the thing that maybe I noticed the most was the fact that it's not space. It's got volume. It's got mass. Everywhere you look, there's life. So it's this three-dimensional environment that's really just teeming with life. It's not like looking up in the air. You could feel the fact that it was it was a presence, you know, that all the weight of the water and everything that was alive in it and all the specks that come down that sort of look like they might just be detritus or marine snow. I mean, some of them are just detritus, but a lot of them are alive. And some of the fishes that you see that are held up to be like, oh, look at the monstrous teeth on this one. They're like the size of a quarter, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so you see them in person and you think, oh my God, these are the cutest little things. And, and all the, the light show, I, I mean, I had read William Beebe's book, of course, the guy who was brave enough to seal himself up into a steel ball and drop into the twilight zone on a cable. He was, I guess, would you agree, the first one to sort of see bioluminescence? Yeah. Yeah, certainly those types, yeah. You know, and how he had written about those lights and almost like a poet. He had really had a lot to say about the color blue and the way the light worked in the water and the, the way the animals used bioluminescence. And, you know, it sort of must have felt to him like being on a real acid trip. And that's a little the way it felt to me as well. It's funny because it is really immersive. I don't think from watching it on TV or, or even video, you get that feeling of the three-dimensionalness of the whole thing. You're not being asked to look at this particular object or this target. It is all of it. It is all of it. All your senses are trying to soak up all of the stuff that's going on, not a narrator on TV saying, look at this animal, and there's other stuff going on in the background. I'm, because I've been trying to think about what, what the difference is, and it's things like that. It's stuff that doesn't translate well in, in digital media. Yeah, you can't feel It's the feeling of it. And that's why one of the things I really want to capture about this experience is how important it is, I think, for people to continue to go down into the environment. Like robots are great. And I did some reporting with Jason, the burly ROV that does a lot of work in the deep. And it was funny because sitting on the ship was Alvin, which is the U.S. Navy in Woods Holes, man submersible that a lot of scientists use in the U.S. And all the pilots that were flying Jason, you could tell they were sort of a little depressed that they didn't get to get into Alvin. And I think all the tools are really important, but there's just something about the human imagination and the actual experience of going into that environment that teaches you something about it that really goes beyond, I think, the intellect and more into the realm of emotional or, you know, I would go so far as to say spiritual. You mentioned William Beebe. I read a, an article recently about him, and the article was, was about why is he not more famous for his scientific output than he is for his storytelling? And they were talking about, have you ever heard of the Sagan effect? When Carl Sagan, the, the famous astronomer who, who did loads of TV stuff in the 80s and everything else, and he was an absolutely unbelievable scientist. But the Sagan effect is where your peers devalue your real scientific contribution if you spend too much time on TV. Yeah, I think that's definitely true in BB's case. But also, there's, I think there's always a little bit of jealousy, too. Because, it, you know, he had to raise money and he was able to raise money because he had this sort of swashbuckling profile and he was in New York City in the mix. And, and, and at the same time, you know, he was making up names for the stuff he saw, like the, the untouchable bathysphere fish and the five fin constellation fish. And I think that drove a lot of ichthyologists kind of crazy, you know? Yeah, he's probably took storytelling a little too far. I just, I just thought the whole story was really interesting. I mean, both the Carl Sagan and the William Beebe one about people who are, you know, really, really well accomplished scientists who have decided 
made a conscious decision to step forward and say, I'm going to tell people about this. I'm going to write books. I'm going to go on TV. I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. And then they're almost punished by their own industry for doing that. I mean, the, the scientific works of Sagan and Beebe are huge. You know, that's not what they're famous for. Their legacy is almost almost a caricature of, of the scientists, which I think is, is really sad. Maybe we shouldn't do podcasts. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I sort of want to push back on that because to me, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I spend a lot of time with scientists. And as a writer and as a journalist, this should be within my realm of possibility is to be able to sit down and talk to somebody and learn about their work and hopefully act as a bridge to somebody else who's not a scientist. Yeah. What great stories don't involve science these days? And so the, the same mind, the same brilliant mind that can maybe understand the, the science is not necessarily the same kind of mind that's going to tell a rip-roaring story. And both of those things are important. You know, I think it would be helpful, and particularly maybe right now when there's this weird relationship that people seem to have with science, to make it more accessible at the same time and making damn sure it's accurate and it represents the science correctly. But I believe there's really a role for that. And sometimes you see it when scientists are particularly good communicators like you guys. What I hope to do anyway is chew it down to the point where anybody could understand it. You know, a 14-year-old could understand it, but it's still true. Yeah. That's quite an art form though, isn't it? Well, it takes a lot of work um, and you have to come across the scientists who are willing to take the time to really explain it to you. I mean, I, I remember when I was trying to understand wave science, so, you know, how does a rogue wave form? It's really complicated, it involves quantum mechanics. I remember seeing this one scientist write an equation. And I, I just thought this looks like chickens stepped in ink and walked all over a whiteboard. Like it was just this crazy equation. But, you know, by the end of the evening, I had the guy explaining it to me using sock puppets. And eventually, you talk to enough people, you find somebody who's good at explaining it, then you can take a stab at writing it in a different way. And then, of course, the most important thing is that you circle back around and make sure the way you've written is, is exactly right. I remember once being uh, told off by one of my bosses a long time ago, I used the phrase dumbing it down. And I'll never forget it. He turned to me and said, never use the phrase dumbing it down. It's about pitching to the right audience. And it's two very different things. You're not dumbing it down. You're just pitching it better. And yes, what's wrong with being super clear? I'm also an editor. And one of the things that, you know, you look at academic writing and you, I, my hands just twitch wanting to edit it. It's needlessly complicated a lot of the times. And there's obviously lots of things that are important about writing it a certain way. But there's also a way to structure a sentence so that it's clear, as opposed to it's just a little bit more convoluted so you think you sound smarter. So uh, along those lines, I mean, how far into this science do you go? Because we spoke to Alex Gould recently, the artist. She was talking about she didn't want to go too far into the science because she felt it ruined the magic. It almost took away any of the mystique or any of the, the first sort of instinctual responses to it. So she was very much like, tell me a little bit, but not everything. Do you want to know everything and then you then get to remold it into a story or are you happy to just get a little bit here and there? You know, I think I can't possibly get everything, but I want to get as much as I can. So there's always a place where I have to stop. One of the things that's happened on my last two books is that I've over-reported on the science and I've started drowning in a little bit. I think there's an important distinction. I find it endlessly fascinating, so I could take a very deep dive, but how much of it can I really include? But in order to actually make that distinction, what is important, what isn't, what is super cool that I think people will find, you know, something they didn't know, but it will delight them. In order to make that decision, I have to know as much as I can. And I want to make sure that if I describe it in some very simplistic way, that that is actually accurate. It's not like misleading or, or wrong. The average person doesn't know so much about it that maybe scientists would assume they do. I've always thought that what's the first thing you tell your mate Dave when you meet him in the pub after you've been away? Do you tell him about the statistical correlation you've just found between X, Y, and Z? Or do you tell him about some ridiculous thing where you nearly got pulled off the back of a boat? <laughs> you know, you tell them the story, you don't tell them the science. So I sometimes think I'm going the other way. Maybe that's why our paths crossed. That's right. That's right. And that's why we <laughs> could have good conversations because that's exactly what I try to do. I don't think the average person, like the, my book, The Wave, is really a book about how climate change is affecting the oceans. You know, there's no way I'm going to set out to write a book about how climate change is affecting the oceans. I really want to tell the story, which you can do through characters, you do through narrative, you do through adventure in order to keep them turning the pages of a book. 
you have to earn their time. And the way you do that is by telling a story and making them care about the characters and something like that. And they've learned a bunch of uh, interesting stuff about the science, but it's almost like I sneak it in. It's the adventure that keeps them interested. It's the people, the emotions they feel when they're experiencing, however vicariously, some crazy adventure. You mentioned climate change there and how to educate people on climate change. And there were papers written that suggest that the more people are told that climate change is bad and you have to make some sort of self-sacrifice to stop it happening and only if all 8 billion people do it, then we're going to prevent the sky from falling and everything else. Actually, that creates a sense of helplessness and actually puts people off. If you want people to look after the planet, you have to make them like it first. And the, the, the looking after will come naturally. But if you tell them, if you don't look after this planet, you're all dead. And actually, puts, it has the reverse effect. So like you say, if you wrap the whole thing of something as, as important as climate change in a story, people read the story, they don't realize that by the end of it, suddenly they really do care. And suddenly they might even subconsciously start to do stuff they wouldn't have done if you had just told them, you better go out and do something about climate change right now. Storytelling, I think, is, is one of the most powerful things that we have that to some degree is being, I feel a little bit eroded in this sort of modern social media type of way of communicating. There's, there's not enough space to get big, complicated, immersive stories out. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Oh, I, I certainly do. I mean, I think it's one of, nobody wants to be told what to think or what to do. You know, there's this instinct of you're not going to tell me what to think or what to do. And then that's one of the things that I think activism, as, as much as it can be really inspiring, is also like somebody sort of really barking at you that you're supposed to do something differently and everything else that you might think is irrelevant. You just have to do this and you have to think this. Nobody wants homework either. For better or for worse, we, we're living in a period of sort of short attention span theater. But at the same time, it's not that people won't pay attention for that long. It's just that the bar has gotten super high to get them to do it. But yet, if you manage to do it, they're in and they're not coming out till the end. Social media isn't built for that. It's built for this quick little snapshot. And, and TV is a different and movies are different. All these are different tools for storytelling. And I think one of the things that you and I have talked about that gets frustrating is that they can't go quite deep enough. So ironically, when they're doing a show about the deep ocean, it's pretty shallow. And so what is the best way to do that? And maybe it's a combination of a lot of things. So there's one major story that can be told eight different ways. There's a, a deep, deep dive in print somehow. There's a bunch of call outs from the print that come up on social media. There, there maybe there's a, an accompanying documentary. I don't think it's, there's no one magic bullet here. If there is any through line that's really important, I think it's the voice um, and the characters. You know, people are interested in people. You take out people and all of a sudden people are way less interested. This brings us back to that question that you're so fascinated by and I'm so fascinated by, why don't people care about the deep ocean? Because they can't project themselves into that environment so easily, right? Yeah, it doesn't feel like there's anything in it for them. Yeah, it's just over there. I don't get to see it. I can't go there. Okay, this is the largest habitat on earth. This really runs the show. Something goes wrong down there. If the chemistry changes in some dire way, like, believe me, it will affect you. But how do you get that across to people, you know, and how do you do it in such a way that it's just not like this spooky house of horrors or threat or a cautionary tale, basically? I think that this, this line, there is actually a line drawn in the sand, and that line is the 200 meter mark, the 200 meter contour, where it's the sea. And then you draw this line at 200 meters, but everything else is deep sea. So it's like, this is the bit that you like, this is the bit you can swim in, this is the bit that you get food from, and you can go on cruises and dive and jet ski on and all this, but everything below this line I've drawn is weird, and it's, it's not for you, it's somewhere else, it's, it's dark, it's dangerous, it's weird. and I think that's, that's the issue, you're actually told this is a different place now, and then, then complain and say, why don't people care about the deep bit? Because you made it weird. <laughs> We've talked about this before as well. It's like there, there are sort of um, narrative cliches almost. Like, yeah. isn't this scary? E everybody thinks it's scary. Well, wait a minute. I happen to think it's kind of magical. There's a, there's a story that gets told over and over and over again. There are words that come up over and over again. Well, what would happen if you tried to tell that story with a different vocabulary? That starts to become really interesting to me. I mean, certainly when, when I got a glimpse of it, as I was coming back up, the thing that I felt more than anything was grief. I just didn't want to get out. And, you know, I don't know if everybody feels this way. Maybe some people with claustrophobia would have been clawing at the ceiling. But I just thought time went, went all elastic. And, and as I was coming up, that's the closest thing I can equate it to is that I just felt like 
I was being ripped away from what felt to me like more like home than land has ever felt. And if you want to know why I write about the ocean, that's probably why, because I really feel more at home in water than I do on land. It's funny in the sense of time you're talking about in the sub many dives we've done, you know, in every dive you do, you have to phone the surface every 50 minutes and say you're okay and report your death and so on and so on. I think probably almost every dive we've lost track of, of whether or not we call back or not. Yeah. Because 50 minutes just goes in a flash. You're like, did we just do that call or not? It's like, and we look at the clock and it's quarter past error and you go, oh, we shouldn't call in. It's like, didn't we just do that? Yeah. And it's just because you're looking out the window and you're like, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this. There's this. You know, and I think you're just a sensory overload, kind of really immersed in it that you, you have no idea. There has been times where I think we've come back and we hit every 15 minute call. But if you'd asked me, I would have said we've missed a lot. <laughs> but you're just sort of into it. So moving on, you're writing a book about deep sea right now. Was it a particular point, a particular event or conversation or something that took you from your last project to that almost, uh, did you have an epiphany moment and went, right, deep sea, that's where it's at. I'm going to do that. And if so, what was it? And going back to the devil's teeth again, it was the water out there at the Farallon Islands was this unbelievable, I like to call this inscrutable water. Like it's not this clear stuff that you can see through to the bottom. It's black. And so we'd be sitting in this little research boat and these 18 foot great white sharks would suddenly emerge out of the water. And it, it also is this place where all these currents sort of collide and these islands are the edge of a tectonic plate. So they plunge something like two miles down to the abyssal plain right there. So there's all this upwelling. You know, one day I saw 40 blue whales breaching. I was, can't believe what's there. We saw everything. We saw make a shark. And I remember thinking, this is so cool. Like you never know what's going to pop up from below. And what is it like down there? What is it like in the part I can't see? That was when I started thinking about this idea of a parallel universe. So there's what we can see, and then there's this whole other world down there. So I was hoping and kind of assuming that the next book I would write would be really about the question, what's down there? But I quickly realized this didn't, it was too big a thing for me to bite off. So the fact that this is now my fourth book, and I I've now been writing about the ocean for almost 20 years. Only now do I feel like I can sort of tackle this and know enough about it that I can have a shot, I think, at doing justice to it. Um, although, obviously, no matter what I write, it's going to be the tip of the iceberg. Well, that's it. I mean, as I said before, the deep sea is so huge that most of the sea is deep sea. Yeah. I think it's 97% of the sea is, is classed as deep sea. So I've always been quite frustrated with books and articles and and episodes of documentary series where they bundle it all up into one thing and suddenly you get this whistle stop tour of maybe 20 things which is supposed to be representative of, of the entire 97 percent of the ocean there's there's enough material in the deep sea to do hundreds of articles or you know almost hundreds of documentaries on because there are so many species and, and of such a variety of habitat and depth and seasonality stuff and everything else it's just such a huge thing that it always gets this weird pigeonhole that you're never going to learn a lot about it because it's it, you're trying to cram so much into a short space that yeah, I find it really frustrating. I don't know if you have to have people feeling like all warm and cuddly about something in order to care about it enough to want to pay attention to it and maybe want it to thrive. But I do think they have to know about it and, and at least understand its importance and maybe have some sense of magic about it. I mean, for lack of a better word, really, it's like this is really cool stuff. I think it's about trying to convince people to just get it and not see it as something which is quite entertaining. You know, you watch the TV series and there's a deep sea episode and it's, it's just, it's almost like a horror movie. It's that, oh, look at those things, look at that. Or it's just got this massive cool factor that then just has no legacy whatsoever. Yeah. It fails to say like, yeah, this is a massive cool factor, but it's a, it's a real thing. It's not an entertainment subject, but it's going to take a lot for normal people, normal people as a scientist are not normal, but uh, yeah, for <laughs> normal people to go, Actually, actually, you know, the deep sea is kind of important. It's a thing that I, I want to know more about. Well, don't you think it's ironic because uh, shark scientists really love to hate Shark Week um, because, you know, it's very spectacular. It's like this sort of shark exploitation. The irony is that if you start to get into the latest shark science, it's so much more interesting than any sort of just shark exploitation. I mean, there's, there's actually a real dimension to it. And if you take the time, I think it's harder, though. Because you actually have to learn something, which is not something that every TV producer wants to take the time to do. You can create a narrative that has a lot more richness to it. So to me, once you take the 
underpinning of the real knowledge that we're gleaning about this stuff, but take it out and you just sort of show a picture of this thing thrashing away at something, you, you're actually missing the whole story. You look at absolutely anything in nature, and I defy you not to find a story. Anyway, right, so let's get to the most important question to wrap this up. What's the best party you've ever been to? <laughs> it's kind of a... That's kind of a trick question. I mean, okay, let me think. It's been a while. Okay, we've been in lockdown for a year, so it certainly hasn't been in the last year. I used to work for Sports Illustrated, um, would cover the Olympics. And back in the day, the one in Athens is the one that I'm thinking of. They would throw these giant parties, four of them, during the Olympics. And all the athletes, I mean, thousands of people have come to these parties. So there was this party in Athens. This is, um, the B-52s played. But honestly, like it was the most fun I've ever had. And I have to tell you, I actually sort of hate parties. <gasps> so in order for a party to be fun for me at all, um, it has to be an amazing party. And that was an amazing party. It takes an Olympic level party to get you it's into an it. Olympic level party. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Thanks you very much, Susan. Thank that you. was brilliant. Thanks for Thank everything. You. Okay. I found that a really interesting chat. And I think this sort of completes a series of podcasts. This this completes an arc we've been going on five episodes. So talking with Alex in episode three about art, I feel like that's the that's the emotional response. That's the most human response, really. A completely emotional one that actually is harmed by science. You said how knowing too much sort of removed that gut experience, that emotional experience. Then I feel that storytelling and journalism bridges that gap between that and the very hard and very dry science, which is quite characterless. So it, it inserts a character, it inserts a, a human you can experience these things through that gives you grounding. We're uh, social animals and we experience things through the eyes of other people. Good storytelling is, is inserting you into a character who is there and who's experiencing this so that you can get a little bit of that emotional element as well. You're still getting the fact but now you fully accept the weight of those facts and you sort of can process that as the emotional animal that we all are and as the, the skill set that we all have. You know, you, you're trained as a scientist or you're trained as an artist, but we're all equipped with an emotional range that allows us to communicate on this wavelength, essentially. And then on the other end, we've got science where in order to be impartial and to see what's really there without any clouding from our interpretation, you have to remove the individual entirely. So you're removing the emotional element completely. And it's very hard. It's very dry. And so as a result, it's difficult to engage. It feels heartless. It feels dry. And it sort of turns a lot of people off. I don't think that's wrong. I think that's what we need to do. Or we become superstitious. You know, we, we see the conclusions that we want to see rather than what's really there. Science is always about always being ready to be wrong. Uh, and just totally accepting it. If, if the evidence proves it, something you've held on to for a decade as being true, you just have to let it go. That's something children do. But I think as adults, I think that's quite a strange skill that hopefully scientists sort of perpetuate. Are you telling me Tommy knockers don't exist? I, I need funding, Alan. I need to do the study. <laughs> <laughs> I need 500 grand to go and find out. Yeah. And, and then when I come back to you with like a scrabbling noise in a mesh bag, you want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Show me the Tommy Knocker. <laughs> it's really angry. Yeah. I feel like this is the conclusion to a, a thought that we've been having over these first five episodes. It's changed the way I've thought about some things. You know, I, I because I can sort of interpret it and speak that language essentially, I like the scientific way and I, I worry that emotions insert errors and bias, but I've got an absolute newfound respect for storytelling and for allowing a little bit of emotion in there, a little bit of emotional intelligence. All right, so let's get personal. What does storytelling mean now? What do you think, Tom? Does it play a big part in your life? I do, I do. Maybe, maybe a bigger part than I realised, and maybe it's a part that I should nurture and be careful to engage with. Yeah, it's a com complex one, because if you think about storytelling as opposed to the actual scientific core of what you're doing. It, I'm finding it's becoming more and more important. The scientific literature is where you put the cold hard science stories, as you say. Although I, just, I still think scientific papers are stories. It's just in a, written in a really weird format, but they are stories, right? They've, they still have a start, a middle and an end. We've argued that a few times, haven't we? That the, it's almost deemed unscientific to be descriptive. You can maintain scientific rigour while still you know, spinning a yarn. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be drive just for the sake of it. Yeah. But it does feel like recent years there's been a greater importance on the stories. 
sort of on the fringes of the actual science itself. I mean, most funding bodies, funding agencies and so on, they, when you're applying for money, you have to put in a some sort of dissemination plan for how you're going to communicate that science beyond your, your own peers. And it can be a huge proportion. So, you know, so it's, it's important enough that it requires a certain degree of public funds. And essentially, that's where those funds often come from. So you need to disseminate, you need to share the things you've learned with the people who've paid for it. Yeah. Because they'll often only interact with the story. They're not going to read the primary literature. Well, it's also about, you know, whether that be the public or policymakers or stakeholders or stakeholders or, or whoever. But Science in a vacuum doesn't achieve anything. It's got to then impact the real world. Yeah, if you don't tell anyone. Or you don't tell them in a way they understand. Yeah. So it's, I think it also, also plays a role in establishing whether or not the science is considered valuable or worth funding more of or was worth the money that was spent on it and stuff like that. So it does become super important, but it's, it's, it's so complicated. I've, I've only because I've sat down and really tried to think about it in a different way. And that's kind of half why we do these podcasts, because it makes you think about stuff you wouldn't normally think about. And I think storytelling has been one of the high points, I think, of, of my career. Maybe not now. Now it's become probably a low point. But, you know, I think back to 2008 when myself and my colleague Toy at the time, we filmed The Deepest Fish in the World. And we had no idea what we were doing. You know what I mean? We, we did it and thought, wow, this is amazing. This is like 20 odd fish or something at close to 8,000 meters, wherever it was, off Japan. You know, after a few beers in Tokyo, we're on the, like the gazillionth floor of a skyscraper trying to FTP this video to Rebecca Morell at the BBC so she could stick it on the website. And we just thought it was funny. And we said, oh, yeah, yeah we we've, we've, we've filmed Deepest Fish and everything else. And it went just nuts i mean it was the, it was a career changing moment and it was just a nice simple nugget of a story that said oh there are there, actually loads of fish really deep and they're kind of weird and cute i can't emphasize how much that that was like a real turning point for me and it was just it was just about the story we told there was no science in it at that point we barely even knew what they were but generally people got really fascinated by that and and all the, all the feedback we got was really positive and, and i think we hit something like three million hits on youtube which for 2008 was Pretty big, considering it was only a 30-second video. And I thought that was great. But then, so, you know, I think shortly after that, we put out another couple. Because we thought, oh, there's some, some merit in doing this. And, you know, we just figured it was, you know, non-political, non-controversial, kind of interesting visuals that people would like. And we put it out. And then at some point around, I think it was 2011, we, we did this thing where we kind of rediscovered these super giants that a weird cryptic thing that were considered very, very rare. And suddenly we accidentally picked up a whole bunch of them. And we're like, ooh, you know, so we put that out. And in both cases, they'd not been seen for like 50 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we thought we thought the, the super giant story was on a par with the deepest fish one, and, and to some degree it was. It went huge as well. We started getting into the storytelling there because I know that the media people who worked with kept saying, "Don't use the word amphipod. Use the word shrimp." I was saying it's <laughs> it's not a shrimp. We can tell the story, and then perhaps by telling the story, if people don't know what an amphipod is, they they would after having read the story. But if you call them a shrimp, you're telling them it's something that it isn't which then nobody learns anything. Yeah, and they'll be forever wrong. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, we thought we got that one right. A lot of the responses were really super positive, right? There was lots of, it was, it was great. But then after a while, we started getting a lot of complaints from public. And I, I say public, and just non-scientists were, were, were writing to me personally. Some of them were horrendous, some of them were quite violent, and some of them were quite well thought out. They were just huge, big, long rants about how we were horrible people. You know, I remember thinking at times, like, how, how are you getting this from that? What, what did we do wrong to go from the deepest fish, unbelievably positive story to the supergiant, which went positive and then suddenly took this weird turn? And it's weird when the fish is the vertebrate. The fish is the, the thing with eyes and a cute face, and it is an animal we empathise with a little bit more. Whereas the supergiant, it's a, a large bug, essentially, to most people. In fact, I know what it was, because I, I did engage with a couple of people. I do have a habit of when people say horrible things, you just you, you email them and say hi. I'm probably not that horrible if you just give us a chance. But the difference became clear, and it was that the fish were filmed alive on the bottom. The amphipod was photographed in someone's hands. A beautiful pair of Scottish hands, I might add. It seems to be, and we, we've, we've tested this out on other press releases, just out of curiosity. And uh, if you take a picture of a specimen on the bench with nice lighting under a microscope or with a nice SLR or something like that and put that out, everybody goes, ooh, look at that, marvelling at these things. If you put those specimens in jars, put them in a museum, people go, oh, look, there's a specimen in a jar. If you show a photograph or a video of them alive in, in the deep sea, then it's like, oh, that's even better, brilliant, you're going to share that, and so on and so on. But if you show a picture of somebody holding it, that seemed to be what the difference was. I remember being accused of being a, on a par with an old colonial tiger hunter bringing back specimens for the queen or something, you know, some really elaborate insults. <laughs> I, I think the term trophy was used, wasn't it? It was trophy, not specimen. Trophy hunting, that was it, yeah. 
And it wasn't. We were just, it was the storytelling didn't really work there. And, and we learned from what people said. And we just don't show pictures of us anywhere near animals anymore because it don't want to upset anyone or offend anyone. So that was a useful exercise. But a lot of it was lost because, you know, there's no story behind a photograph like that. You don't necessarily know why that person is going, my God, look at the size of this. You know, they're not they're not going, look what I just killed. <laughs> but without the story, you, you, you can interpret that either way. Again, it's it's projecting your own emotions onto a character. And unfortunately, that just that pose and being happy as a scientist that you've made a big breakthrough and you're there for scale holding the, the specimen, yeah. it just looks too much like trophy photos. Yeah. So we don't issue photos anymore of us holding dead animals. We just don't do it. We just take nice pictures of them or put them in a museum or put pictures of them alive. And 99% of what we do where we work anyway, we don't catch anything anyway. So <laughs> it's not like it's going to be any inconvenience to us to, to make sure people read our stuff and they're happy with it. So again, that, that was how storytelling had to adapt a little bit to get the most out of it for everybody involved. And then that's changing now. I think I don't recall in recent years having any negative interactions with with public over anything we're doing. I think what we're doing now, particularly the sort of more exploration and expedition types and some of the media stuff we're doing, seems to sit really well with the public. The trouble now is other scientists, and it's becoming really quite toxic. And again, it's coming back down to storytelling on multiple layers. Storytelling is really important, but things like Twitter and Facebook are the worst platforms ever for actually telling a decent story, right? So what's happening now is there's snippets of, of bits of information going out and people just fill in the blanks with what they think. And that's led to a whole manner of animosity at the moment. I mean, I was up till two o'clock in the morning last night trying to undo the damage that other scientists have been doing because of not taking the time to find out what the actual story is. And th that's where it's becoming really weird. When people bash us on Twitter or Facebook, whatever it is, I, I don't care what they actually say because they're misinformed. But I always email them. I make a point of everyone who says something nasty about myself or colleagues, I email them and say, look, why don't we have a conversation? Here's my phone number, give me a call. And if you still if you still feel like that after a phone call, then fine. It's, you're entitled to your opinion. But at least, as a scientist should, at least be in possession of all the facts before you go doing that. And nine times out of ten, I get an email back almost immediately saying, no, I'm not willing to talk to you face to face. And that's that's the culture we now work in which I think is really, really sad. Where do you go from that? Because again, what's causing the issue there is not the science. It's not the, the materials and methods. It's not the conclusions. It's not the funding. It's not the... It's not peer review. It's not peer review. It's, it's the storytelling on the fringes of all, which is, are driving these huge fracture zones between the elements. I like the, the pun there with fracture zones. I know, it's good. Very topical. It's, it's that which is which causing a, a rift, if you like, in parts of the community. So, Are you allowed to talk about the fact you weren't allowed to talk about it? That was the origin of a lot of the issues. I mean, these issues go back well beyond before Five Deeps, to be fair. But Five Deeps is a good example of that. Is, is that we weren't allowed to talk about it. We just weren't allowed to. There was legal reasons why we still can't really talk about it. So we don't. Unfortunately, our crime, if you like, in all this is not telling the story so that other people can just make up their version of what we did. But no one actually knows what we did because no one has ever told anybody what we actually did. The only information that goes out are a few tweets here and there and some journalists come on and write a third party sort of story with some sort of spin on it which sometimes works, sometimes really don't. And that's then been taken as science fact, which is weird that scientists are taking journalists' opinion first and ignoring the fact that there is an opportunity to find out the truth, but then refusing to then engage with that. And that's what's really frustrating with me. It's not what people say. It's the, it's the fact that it's happening at all. I just think it's really disheartening. But it is what it is. So, you know, we, we perhaps didn't tell the best story and therefore people would just make up their own story. And then we end up in this sort of stalemate where I'm at the point now I'm just not going to engage anymore. And that, that's, that's kind of the saddest bit. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to stand up in a, at a conference uh, and talk about five deeps in front of a bunch of deep sea scientists so it's, it's to the point where that's not happening anymore and it's sad that it's not the science that's driven that it's the storytelling I, I i don't know how to make this right in the way we did when the public were having a go because i think they had a legitimacy into what they were annoyed about and we can make very easy steps to rectify that well there was a back and forth yeah if there's no communication then you can't rectify it so it just is where it is talking to the people who who felt that way and then like oh it does look like that oh sorry no like this is our yeah. this is our job. We do this every day. We don't see how that looks like that, and and we get yeah. it. You know, it still has to be in your hand. The fact that it's acceptable when that specimen is in a jar, somebody's hand put it in a jar. It just depends at which phase in that process you take a photo. And we're all kind of conditioned 
somebody takes your photo, you smile. Yeah. I got some media training and one of the examples they gave was a, a scientist who who dealt in quite a morbid field, brought onto sort of the BBC. And it was, it was his big break. It was a big deal that his work was getting sort of shown on the BBC. And so even though the topic was horribly morbid, he was beaming from ear to ear. To ear. Oh, <laughs> and no. that's a terrible optic. But, you know, to him, it was like, oh, this is, this is my, my, my career. This is my life's work. And people are finally listening. And I'm so happy to be listened to. But optically, that looks awful. So it feels like we're kind of stuck in this loop whereby... Do you tell a story or do you not tell a story? Because if you tell a story and someone doesn't like it, it's too easy now to to end up embroiled in one of these ridiculous online tit for tat. So it's better just to not talk about it at all. And if you don't talk about it at all, then people will just make it up. What I struggle with is the situation with the public, for example. It's more to do with how the science is presented. It's the reasons for how that thing ended up in your hand. What's happening now from like peer-to-peer critique it's entirely personal. It's not to do with the science. It's not to do with anything else. It's a stab at from one person to another person to try and effectively try to damage a colleague. And that's where it becomes too much. So if you don't challenge it, it's out there and it's doing you little bits of harm. It's like being so punished because you haven't explained yourself well enough. And I, I just find that really hard to deal with. Some of the stuff that's come out is that received negative feedback is because we're not conforming to what science is thought to be. I know science is the mother of conformity, but it doesn't have to be boring. Expeditions don't have to be boring and sterile and predictable. When you write stories about deep sea, they don't have to follow the same predictable succession of stories that are always told. And it seems to be just because few people decide to do something a bit differently, then it's like, oh, no, no, but that's not what we do. That's not conformity. It's like the moon analogy. Let's go back to episode one. It's like, wait a minute, he hasn't said that we know less about this than the surface of the moon, therefore... You've got to say that or it doesn't count. You have to. It's like, wait a minute, you tell me more people have been on the moon than have been to the Challenger Deep. I'm starting to feel that we live in a, or we work in a, an industry of cliche and predictability. I'm quite glad to not conform to that. Way back in episode one, Don actually spoke a lot about storytelling and he really admired it as an art. He talked about some scientists that were particularly good storytellers at the same time and the, the issues that they faced when doing that, which then we revisited with Susan as part of the, the Sagan effect. So we reached out to Don for a good example of a, a story about storytelling, basically. Hello, my name is Don Walsh and for six decades I've worked as an oceanographer and as an explorer uh, in all parts of our world. And I'd like to offer some comments on a subject I like to call the explorers and the storytellers. But first, let's look at what constitutes exploration. My definition of exploration is curiosity acted upon. That is, we observe something and we act on our curiosity about that something. And that's the first step of exploration. However, explorers tend to be rather singular people. Uh, most are not very good storytellers. Well, yes, I mean, around the old campfire and among their peers, they're great storytellers. A little bit of braggadocio stirred in with all of that. What I'm talking about is communicating with people beyond our realm of exploration. The people, frankly, that do the offer the support and the sponsorship of exploration, whether they're individual uh, uh, persons, uh, foundations, not-for-profits, charities, or even governmental committees. The thing is, if they don't understand what we do or what we've done and where we did it and why it's important, then sources of support are hard to, hard to come by. And it's been my observation that many explorers are either not interested in writing for the unwashed public or do not enjoy sitting at a desk grinding out the results of their expeditions. In the former case, this is where the storytellers can come in and assist an explorer in telling his or her story so that future support might be gained. What's the reason for this? Well, most explorers uh, are solitary and supremely self-centered. The best are good or even great leaders but like a captain of a ship, they have absolutely supreme authority as to who is in charge. This is absolutely necessary to ensure both safety and productivity when in the field, and also to maintain the highest possible standards of the data uh, and artifacts that are collected uh, on an expedition. I think the best way to encapsulize the perhaps the typical explorer is a statement made by 
a member of the Royal Geographic Society in the mid-1800s. Quote, explorers are not, perhaps, the most promising people with whom to build a society. Indeed, some might say that explorers become explorers precisely because they have a streak of unsociability and a need to remove themselves at regular intervals as far as possible from their fellow men, close quote. Now let's consider the role that the storytellers play in their work with explorers. The idea of having someone on your expedition to uh, keep a record, a journal, if you will, of your work uh, is as old as exploration itself. And I'm not talking about the keeping of scientific records. That goes without saying. A, any scientist in the field is going to keep a record of, of remarks and artifacts collected, but rather who's telling the general story, the human interest story of an expedition. And that's the role of the storyteller. There are lots of examples of uh, storytellers. Um, I'll give you a couple that most, most of us have heard about. One was uh, the, uh, the great uh, travel adventure writer Lowell Thomas, uh, who probably is most well known for helping uh, bring the legend of Lawrence of Arabia to life, being uh, with Lawrence in the deserts in the Middle East during World War I. He went on to become a filmmaker, a, a radio uh, commentator, and uh, also an early pioneer in television. He was so highly regarded by explorers as a storyteller that the Explorers Club in New York City named its building after Lowell Thomas. Another example would be the explorer and documentary filmmaker Jacques Cousteau, who uh, influenced generations of young people to uh, seek uh, uh, careers in, in uh, oceanography. But there is one that I have personal history with, and that is John Steinbeck, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in uh, 1961, and also a Pulitzer Prize uh, for writing uh, in uh, 1941. Um, in the early 40s, I think I may have been 10 or 11 years old, my father introduced me to this very interesting writer who lived in the Monterey Bay area and said that I'd probably be interested in knowing this man because he had written something about the ocean. It turned out that uh, Steinbeck in, in 1941 had published a book called Sea of Cortez. Uh, that was based on expeditions that he and Doc Ricketts had been doing in the Sea of Cortez or the Gulf of California since the mid 1930s. Steinbeck was a actual participate in Ricketts' work and worked in his laboratory and also with him in the field. And uh, it was this work that resulted in the writing of this book, which is now a classic of literature about the sea. And I guess John Steinbeck saw something in this small boy, and he handed me a copy. Um, I was too young to realize the potential value of uh, personal value of something like that, and so I never asked for him to inscribe it. My loss. Nevertheless, today it has a place of honor in my library. To finish up on a tale from the high seas, I've got a story in mind that I want you to tell, Alan, but I just wanted to give a little bit of context first about the Siemens missions. Anyone who works offshore will be aware of this network. It's 150 years old, an international support network for people who work offshore. It's technically a, a Christian religious organization. It's usually ran by a chaplain. And so there's a, a place of worship and somebody to talk to. Uh, of course, working offshore can be incredibly stressful. It's hard work. It's remote work. You feel very isolated from your family. Uh, and so an ear to talk to is in incredibly important. But they've also become community centers. So you'll get internet access, advice and support sort of going into the legal side of things as well. And sometimes you'll get cheap food and board if you just want a night off the vessel. Or if maybe you're traveling back home the next day and you need a cheap place to stay. But even down to like what feels like a bar and there's pool tables and you meet people from other boats and you all sort of pal around. So it's incredible to be traveling the globe and then almost go into your local and that sort of weird community feel to these places. And I'll always have a, a soft spot for them because Christmas Day in port in Aberdeen, it was a bit lonely. And the chaplain from the local seamen's mission came and visited the boat. It was like Santa coming, basically. He, he gave us little presents and there, there were just gestures, really. It was just a, a toothbrush and a nice woolly hat and comfort things, really. But symbolically, I really liked that. I, it really picked me up that day. It was nice to have this, this welcoming character appear and, and wish us a Merry Christmas. Did you check that other people could see this guy, Tom? 
<laughs> this is like the snowman. Oh. Because was it all a dream, but then I found the scarf. Ah, maybe that's it. So I know it was true. Yeah, maybe he came just to visit you and nobody else. I looked in the mirror and I was Bowie. Yeah. He did melt and die at the end. It was really sad. Oh. Uh, but this, this leads to a story about storytelling based in a seaman's mission. This was uh, New Zealand, wasn't it? Yeah, we were on a long expedition to the Kermadec train. I remember we went with a guy, was, was his name Andy, I think it was. We used to call him, I think it was All-American Andy. He was an engineer on the vessel and he, he was the most American guy we've ever met. And he wore like a Star Spangled Banner bandana and stuff like that. He was brilliant. He was such good fun. And he said, all right, we're going to go to the mission. To be honest, I've never been on a mission before. I'm like, well, why, why are we going to the mission? He's like, well, it's a dollar a can. I was like, what is the mission? He goes, it's a church. It's like, so we're going to go to a church because it's a dollar a can of lager. And he's like, yeah. He asked what we were doing, didn't he? I think he, and I guess he was expecting us to say we were fishermen or, or offshore. This is the or chaplain, it was. wasn't and, it? Yeah, this is the chaplain himself. And he said, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, we've got this 11,000 meter ROV and we're trying to explore what lives at the bottom of the trench off the north coast. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. So then he starts off by giving us some sort of sermon, didn't he? Well, we got the one dollar beers in, right? Yeah, got what we came for. So yeah, the church got one dollar beers, and he gives us the sermon. And the whole thing was just getting more and more <laughs> surreal. And then uh, I can't remember how one thing led to another, but he said to me, "Well, what you're doing is really interesting. Uh, would you write us a, an article for the newsletter?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. You know, I'll do one. I'll give me your email address. I'll we'll write something." And he says, "No, no." I want you to write it now. <laughs> I'm like, what? Suddenly the tone shifts. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm like, okay, you want me to write you an article right now? Knock back the dollar beer and get another one in. I'm like, oh, this is going to be weird. He says, oh, you can use my computer. I'm like, oh, okay. So he goes, it's through in the office. I'm like, oh no, I'm being separated now. I'm being separated from the rest of them. I've been warned and about this. in the office. And he goes, there's a computer now. Just start typing. So I'm sat at his computer, a little bit tipsy, in the office of the chaplain in the Siemens mission. It's running like Windows 3.1 in a word processing software you've never seen before. <laughs> then he, he leaves the office and locks it behind him. So he, like, he locks me in the office. I'm like, what is going on here? So I sort of frantically type out a couple of paragraphs as to what we were doing there and what this RV was and blah, 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 blah. And then just had to wait. I just had to wait until he decided that I'd, I must have spent long enough on this article. It was the most surreal thing. The whole, the whole time in Auckland got weirder and weirder. That was also the same night we watched a guy from Florence singing Barbie Girl at a Korean karaoke club. You remember that, don't you, Tom? Because we hugged him at the end. It was that beautiful. I was genuinely moved. <laughs> it was such a new element to his personality. Never in a million years would we have guessed he would have sung Barbie Girl. And he did the actions as well. Yeah, he knew the whole thing. He's quite a reputable scientist now. We, we still will remember him as Barbie Girl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Siemens mission was, was wonderful and it was very surreal. And they were very nice and welcoming. I'm not sure why they locked the door, though. That was the term. That click, I'll never forget that click. It's when he tells all of us that you've left. Oh no, your mate's gone. You should leave. Or he wants you to write another article and you go into another office and that gets locked as well. <laughs> He's, got He's trying to separate us. He's divide and conquer. One of them will write something good. If I keep locking these scientists away and getting them to write things, one of them's going to be good. I know, I almost forgot to check. I don't know if it ever got published or not. I'm sure it wasn't my best work. But <laughs> like, what, under duress? <laughs> <laughs> under duress, a little bit tipsy with some really, really cheap canned lacquer. <laughs> So that concludes our episode, and thematically it kind of concludes this arc about science communication and about deep sea perception. It's not going to be like this every time, we just had a narrative we wanted to tell essentially, we had a thought we wanted to move through. Some big names are coming up, I don't know how we've managed that, but uh, some very interesting stuff coming up, and we're going to talk about some topical issues as well. We'll of course touch on marine plastics and microplastics, we'll of course touch on deep sea mining. But I feel that this first batch of five really has, has completed a thought, has filled a narrative, and it's a good primer for the things we're later going to go on and talk about. And we managed to say the phrase, I am your tongue now. I am your tongue now. What was the one from this one? You said something creepy earlier. Show me the Tommy Knocker. Show me, show me the Tommy Knocker. If this takes off, we'll start doing merch. I would love to have a baseball cap with uh, I am your tongue now written on it. <laughs> and a little picture of an isopod. So I'd like to thank Marvel for letting us use their track, The Hadal Zone Express. Also, you might notice this episode sounding a lot nicer. For that, we have Frankie Faluda to thank. He gave me a shameful amount of his time for a crash course in podcast recording and editing for no good reason other than being a really top bloke. So a shout out to Frankie, who also produces the podcast Hard Candy and Fruit Snacks, 
where two lifelong interracial friends sort of discuss contemporary racial issues. It's a nice 20 minute sort of bite sized conversational piece. So thank you, Frankie, for the time you spent hopefully getting this sounding nicer. You can contact us at podcast at armatasoceanic.com and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I'm getting some emails, so I know there's people out there. I know you're listening. Uh, I know quite a few marine scientists listen to this. Uh, I don't know why we're not telling you something you don't already know. Uh, but if you have an interesting Tales from the High Sea, feel free to record it or write it down and we'll read it out. If you are someone who just has an interest in the deep sea, feel free to send us a question. Shall I do my cringy catchphrase just to end off? I go for it. I've got to admit, you, you might have to start thinking of some, mate, because it's, uh, it's, it's getting bad. Go on then. What have you got? All right, then. My, my catchphrase for this week that I'm going to try out that you're going to love like all the other ones is... And hey, Dal, you like that episode. That doesn't even work. No, it doesn't, does it? Go on, what was it supposed to be? Like, how do you like that episode? Hey, Dal, you like that episode? That just doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. No, I think you really need to sit down and have a word with yourself over that one. I'm over the puns now and I'm onto merch. I want, I want an I am your tongue now hat. The Deep Sea Podcast is supported by our company Armatus Oceanic. If you'd like to explore the deep sea yourself, we can provide technology and know-how to allow you to do that. But if you'd like to bring the deep sea to your audience, we can also support you with fact-checking, storytelling, and presentations. We want the deep sea to be accessible to everyone. Hello, children, and welcome to a new podcast, Biology Stories at Bedtime. Stories for children inspired by the natural world. Tonight's story is The Little Isopod That Needed a Friend. Once there was a tiny isopod alone in the big blue sea. So lonely and vulnerable, they desperately wanted a friend. Just then, a big fish swam past. If I had a friend as big and strong as that fish, I would never be lonely again. They would keep me safe and we could be together forever. But how was the little isopod going to get the big fish's attention? How can they be friends forever? The little isopod swam up to the fish, in through its gills, and gave the fish's tongue the biggest, hardest hug that they could. The fish, surprised by this, shook as hard as they could, but the little isopod was hugging just too tightly. The little isopod devoured the fish's tongue, withering it to a nub. How can I eat now? thought the fish. I'm done for, but at least this horror will be over. Oh no, said the little isopod. I won't allow you to die until I'm done with you. We will be together forever. I am your tongue now. Wasn't that a fun story, kids? A lifelong friendship in the ocean. Night, night, sleep tight. Don't let the bedbugs bite. It is important that the bedbugs are not allowed to gain purchase. <laughs>